Today, the Prime Minister's Rwanda bill has passed its first hurdle in the House of Lords, with 206 voting against a motion to block it, against 84 voting in favour. That's a majority of 122. It wasn't without opposition, though. We just heard from Emily in the headlines. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, warned the plan is leading the nation down a damaging path, while the former Home Secretary, Lord Ken Clark, said he can no longer support the bill in its current form. Right, I'm delighted to say we're joined by our political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, and former Labour advisor, Mike Buckley. Alicia, let's start with you. How much closer does it make uh, the likelihood of people being sent to Rwanda, what happened last night in the House of Lords? Well, that's the dreaded question, really, isn't it? So, we've, as we all know, we've had so many debates about this. It's passed through the House of Commons, reached the House of Lords, and they decided not to block it. Lots of laws coming forward last night and saying that their role is actually just to scrutinise legislation rather than actually block leg legislation. This means that this will now pass to what we call the committee stage in, in, in a parliamentary process. And that is basically where a committee sits between both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. People can still table amendments to make changes to the bill. They all discuss it and they decide one final time what should stay in and what should go out. So we've still got that process left. And that is probably where we will see the House of Lords intervene a bit more than they did yesterday, maybe try and make some changes and we'll see the bill kind of take final form. In direct response to your question, we still have a long way to go until any flights are actually taking off. There's still a lot of obstacles to clear before that happens. Some of the Lords, their criticism, uh, Mike, yesterday was uh, pretty stinging. Uh, some suggesting this is moving towards an elected dictatorship. Others saying um, this is like trying to pass a law to make the sky green and the grass blue. Even if these Lords have considerable concerns, the impact they're actually able to have at this point is fairly muted. I don't think that's true, actually. I mean, the Lords can rip this bill to shreds if they want to. They're very unlikely to block it. And the motion, the, the news story today is that the, the blocking motion didn't go through, but that was almost never going to happen. Mm. The Lib Dems are backing that, but almost nobody else was because the rest of the peers were saying, look, there were significant problems with this bill. We're not even the Archbishop of Canterbury was saying, significant problems. We won't block it because that isn't the job of the Lords, but we will scrutinise it and we will criticise it and we will amend it. So I would imagine when it goes back to the Commons, it will be very different. You even had Tory peers yesterday, like Ken Clark, former Conservative Chancellor, saying, look, this is very, very dangerous. It's essentially the point that you made. This mm. is working towards an elected dictatorship. Because he was saying it's not the job of Parliament to overrule the Supreme Court. You know, the, the powers in this country are separated between power and the monarchy and the judiciary. And for Parliament to say to the judiciary, well, you're wrong, it's just not something that happens in the British Constitution. And therein lies the tension, Lysia. Yes, exactly. So, as Mike was saying, the, the, the overall problem of this hasn't gone away just because it progressed last night. Still, the issue is that loads of people, whether they're in the House of Lords or the House of Commons, either think that it's unfair and wrong of the government to try and bypass that Supreme Court's ruling that Rwanda is a safe country. Well, remember just last week, the House of Lords kind of had a pre-debate debate about this to try and say that they think the whole process should be delayed until Rwanda actually makes some changes to their asylum system. Because at the moment, they're saying nothing's changed between the Supreme Court saying it was unsafe to now. How can we suddenly rule it to be something totally different to what the court is saying? And that problem's still there. To, to what extent, Mike, could the House of Lords just delay the process? Because obviously, there's a hard stop, I would imagine, when we come to an election, which everyone seems to be suggesting is going to happen in November. Uh, if the House of Lords are, are going to scrutinise this to death, does that delay it at all, or is there a set period by which they say, OK, we've done all our scrutiny, now we're going to hand it back to the Commons? I don't... I've not heard any peers talking about it. I'd be very surprised if the Lords did delay it and delay it deliberately. I think they will scrutinise it. They? Can they delay it? They can delay it if they want to, but I don't think that they will. I think they will scrutinise it and they will put it through the necessary committee. They won't rush, but I don't think they'll unnecessarily delay it. I think they will want to put it back to the Commons as soon as they can for it to be debated there, but it will almost certainly be sent back to the Lords, and I would imagine they'll have the same criticisms. In the meantime, Alicia, a whole lot of other parts of infrastructure are taking place, run by particularly the Home Office, to try and make sure that when the legislation, if the legislation comes to pass, they can actually practically get these flights off. That's things like um, security officials being trained of how to literally get people on and off flights. There's lots of other things happening in the background to try and ensure this bill goes smoothly. Yes, definitely. So we heard uh, a couple of days ago that they were, they were getting kind of police officials and, and military officials to practice putting 
putting migrants on the flights forcibly without their consent in the case that maybe a migrant would turn around and say that they didn't want to and kick mm. up kind of a physical fuss there. But lots of criticism to that is that we haven't got anywhere near the point where migrants would even be entering the runway of, of a plane, let alone actually getting on it. So lots of people are saying, you know, hold your horses. There are so many more obstacles to clear before we get to that point. Should we not just focus on actually making sure the bill works before even wasting resources, money and time on, on things like that? Should we talk about a political breakthrough rather than a bit of a deadlock? The DUP might explain to us what happened yesterday because after two years of fairly sort of torturous and protracted negotiations or stalemates, a breakthrough. A real breakthrough and a genuinely a real good news story as well. So the DUP, so one of the, the, the main unionist party in Northern Ireland who favour keeping the union with the United Kingdom, they've been very angry for two years over the Brexit trading deal, which has put a border down the Irish Sea between, the, between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That's increased cost of businesses on both sides. This is a result of the Brexit deal that Boris Johnson chose. So because the DUP wants to remain very close to the rest of the United Kingdom, they've been very angry about this and they have refused to allow their governing body, Stormont, the Stormont Assembly, their devolved parliament, to, to actually sit. They're also angry because in their last elections, they came second before that. They'd always come first. So this is partly kind of sour grapes on their part for the fact that they came kind of second, so we'll have Deputy First Minister instead of First First Minister, if you sort of mean. However, good news is they finally decided that they will go back, allow Stormont to sit and go back into government, which is great news for the people of Northern Ireland, because without a government for two years, there have been lots of things that just haven't got done, mm. and it's made life much more difficult for people over there. What was on the table that the DUP had to agree? What, what has now changed about the way that the, the, trade or the trade movement of goods between the UK mainland and Northern Ireland has, has actually been accepted by the DUP? Well, it was all about free movement, really. So Northern Ireland felt like their movement of trade was just really restricted by that Brexit deal that Boris Johnson tabled. So they've just been really trying to campaign, in effect, to make sure that they had more opportunities for trade because they felt like that whole thing just totally scuppered their trade opportunities. So I think now that has changed a little bit. They now have some more opportunities to do that. And I think it's, it's probably just a bit of a work in progress. I don't think this is necessarily a done deal and this will be the end of the DUP asking for things and trying to negotiate with the government, but it just shows that some progress has been made there. Yeah, a significant breakthrough in, at the very least. Um, train strikes today. Here we go. You might think, here we go again. Nick doesn't know how he's going to get home yet. You may have a difficult commute yourself today. But let's explain, because as left are going on strike, and we're all supposed to believe now, OK, the government have introduced legislation, which means the impact of these strikes should be reduced, but the train companies are saying, we're not using it. What's going on? Yes, so I'm sure lots of people will remember when the government introduced what they called the minimum service legislation. And the whole point of that was to try and force companies who were going on strike to basically have to enact some level of basic minimum service, whether that's schools, transport, you know, anything, doctors, all of these sectors that we're seeing. 40% was the figure that's been knocked around. Yeah, so, so still quite a significant chunk. And that would just mean that the disruption is less intense. So, you know, you'd, you'd still have trains, but a reduced service. But we're hearing today that the ASLEF union, they are striking at the start of what is set to be a big wave of strikes. They have decided not to use the minimum service legislation. It's kind of unclear at the moment what the punishment is for yeah. not using it. Well, I, I read in the Times that the uh, last time the train operators tried to uh, impose this 40% minimum service agreement, ASLEF said, right, we're not going on strike for one day, we're going on strike for five days. Mm. And so then it goes to the courts, and it's whether or not they want to spend a load of money in the courts trying to persuade the, the, the train operating company, uh, the, 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 the unions, to actually deliver what the legislation says they can deliver. I mean, Mike, is, is this, does this therefore mean that this legislation, minimum service legislation, don't, doesn't work, won't work? Or well, is it, it only could... within regard to this train well, It looks like that, doesn't it? I mean, what the, what the legislation doesn't take into account for is that people, other people can still make choices. As you just said, ASLEF can make the choice of saying, well, we're not going to strike for one day, we're going to go for five days, making life way more difficult for passengers and much more difficult for the train operating companies as well. So it looks like the companies have just decided we don't want to go through all that hassle. We want to try and maintain as good a working relationship as possible with ASLEF so we won't use this legislation. Mm. Mike, are you supportive of the strikes? I am supportive of people being paid for the work that they do at a reasonable level. I think the strikes have gone on an incredibly long time. I mean, I use the trains all the time. I don't have a car, so it's my main form of transport. It puts me out, but lot, puts lots of people out when the strikes go on. The government should have entered into proper negotiations. I mean, a very long time ago. This has been going on a very, very long time. But I do think the responsibility lies with the government to resolve this, and they just haven't. But the government have come to resolutions with the RMT, with Unite. ASLEF seems to be this sort of just sticking at it. And there's a little bit of confusion. We're going to speak to ASLEF a little bit later 
on the programme as to whether their members have been able to vote on this latest pay offer, which would mean train drivers are earning about £65,000 a year. Is that a fair deal? I mean, granted, that sounds like a lot of money to most people. Um, I don't quite know where they should be landing in terms of uh, a salary, but they're not just concerned about that. They are also concerned about passenger safety. So, for example, the government wanting to reduce the number of staff on trains, which will put passenger safety at risk. So, the ASLEF understandably are concerned about pay for their staff, but it's not just that. Alicia, at the end of last year, it felt like maybe there'd been some progress with strike action, but now we see the NHS consultants rejecting their pay off for train strikes again. For the Prime Minister, this problem has not gone away. Definitely not. And we're we still in the same situation where the unions are saying the government haven't been open to talks and they haven't been, you know, very receptive and compromised. And the government is saying, hang on, we've been trying to speak to you and we've given you this really decent pay offer. So until that kind of stalemate breaks between the two, I don't think we're going to see much drastic progress.